Hello and welcome to episode 305 of the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. My name is Seth Paradin, historian and deputy director of the Mississippi Armed Forces Museum here at Camp Shelby. And with me, as always, is my esteemed co-host, retired Navy Captain Bill Toady, former skipper of the Fast Attack Submarine USS Indianapolis, Commodore of Submarine Squadron 3 in Pearl Harbor, and many other assignments. How are you this morning, Bill? I'm doing okay, Seth. Tomorrow I'm having surgery on my right shoulder, so I'm going to be in a sling for yeah. about six weeks. Um, yeah. you know, and, and we'll see how that goes. I'm, I hope I'm not going to live to regret this. But 10 years ago, I was playing softball in a senior league. Yeah, I was a senior 10 years ago. That's how old I am. <laughs> and I tore that rotator cuff, and they did a bit of work on it back then and gave me 10 years of pain-free life, and now... Um, I think they have to fix it for real. So wish me luck. Hmm. Well, good luck with that. And uh, hopefully uh, you turn out as good as others that I know that have had that surgery and have turned yeah. out just fine. So I'm sure. But my baseball sure career is over, I'm afraid. Started in high school and hey. ended at the age of 60. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, mine is also long since over as well. <laughs> long since over. Yeah. Well, uh, but before we get started, uh, we want to, as we always have here in the last couple, well, last couple seasons, really ask you to like and subscribe to our channel. Please like the videos as they come up and subscribe to our channel. It helps us out, helps get our show out to other people who have not seen what we are producing here. So with that, uh, the United States Navy of World War II was an ever evolving beast, a Navy that at the start of the war in the Pacific was a shell of what it should have been and nothing like what it would be. The ships that sailed the seas of the Pacific in 1942, for the most part, would not see the surrender in 1945. For sure, some would, but many would not. Uh, they would fall victim to Japanese bombs, kamikazes, or the dreaded Long Lance. And while the Navy changed drastically through the years, early years of the war, both in terms of ships, men, commanders, and tactics, one thing stayed the same. It stayed the same from the morning of December 7th, 1941, until a kamikaze knocked her out of the war finally in May 1945. In that time period, this all-star, this leadership school was ever-present, always around, always available, and always won. From her deck flew some of the most legendary men to wear wings of gold. From her deck, aircraft took off that helped change the course of the war. On her bridge sat some of the most influential and legendary men in naval history. And in her bowels sailed some of the greatest sailors to ever walk the earth. In her time at war, she accumulated the most battle stars by a ship in the Navy's 229-year history. Her name is easily the most recognizable ship's name in history. Her story is legend. She is, of course, Enterprise. Now, Bill, we have had a lot of requests to do. If we were going to do a a uh, battle history, if you will, of U.S. Navy ships, Enterprise was the one that people have requested literally since the first episode of this podcast aired. So that being said, it's this, this is an important story, and, and I'm going to put a disclaimer on this now, it's a long story. So because it's so dang long, we actually are going to break Enterprise's battle history into two episodes because this thing saw literally every piece of combat with the exception of one major battle through the entire war. So it's just too dang long to fit into one listenable or watchable episode. So we'll split it into two. But Bill, I mean, you're a, you're a academy graduate. You, the, you are ingrained with blue and gold. Enterprise yeah. stands out above all others, doesn't it? It, it does. And you know, the, the interesting thing from the perspective, I mean, I don't want to jump to the end of the story. It's, it's the most legendary storied, certainly aircraft carrier in history, to the extent that when we built our first nuclear powered aircraft carrier, what was its name? USS Enterprise. Enterprise. And then when we had, a, and then, then Star Trek was created by Gene Roddenberry. What did he name his, his starship? USS Enterprise. And then when the country was going to build the first space shuttles, and there was a competition among the public, what did they, de they, what did they decide was going to be the name of the first space shuttle? USS Enterprise. Now, I think that if the public had known it at the time, 
that the, that enterprise would actually never fly into space. They would have wanted to hold the name for one of the later shuttles that actually did right. fly into space. But it's a, it's a legendary name. And I would say that there were enterprises before this one. Sure. But this is the one that really established the name as a marquee in United States Navy history. And Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, there is another enterprise on the way, is there not? There is, yeah, absolutely. And so we're, we're all excited about that. Carriers are built at glacier pace, so it's going to be a while before we see it go to sea. But yes, um, it's going to be a, you know, a Gerald Ford class aircraft carrier and uh, can't wait until it gets mm -hmm. launched. Yeah, uh, I think it's fair the, to say the name. To, uh, this is your favorite ship, yeah. isn't it? I, I can be accused of having the Indianapolis as my favorite ship. I commanded the submarine Indianapolis, and my association with those survivors of World War II ship, I will ad admit that it is. But if you had to name one, it would be Enterprise, wouldn't it? Without a doubt, yeah. I, you know, when I was a kid, um, I'm not going to get too much into personal story because we want to get to the actual history here, but I'll say this. <clears throat> When I was a kid, and I'm talking like nine years old, I went to a used bookstore and I was looking on the history shelf and I saw the book, The Big E. It's a paperback version of the book, The Big E by Edwin Stafford. And I pulled it off the shelf and I looked at the cover and it had this iconic picture of the Enterprise. Well, it was a painting, but it was the iconic image of, of an SBD taking off from the uh, flight deck of Enterprise. You know, that bow on shot, that iconic shot. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. I'll put it up here in the video. I saw that and I didn't know Jack squat about enterprise, but I was like, this looks cool. And I brought the book home and I read it. And I was, like I said, a kid, you know, and I read that book cover to cover at least four or five times in my life. And as a matter of fact, just a few years ago, I was going through some of my old junk and I found that very copy of the same book. It's back here on my shelf back here, but that started the love for enterprise was reading that biography uh, of that ship and all the guys who sailed on her. And then as my career developed, and especially when I was at world war II museum, I, got to know a great, great many people, sailors, you know, black shoes and brown shoes who were on Enterprise from before Pearl Harbor to the end of the war. And I, mm -hmm. after a while, I started seeking those guys out just to talk to people who sailed on the Big E. And it was still to this day, one of the greatest thrills of my life, knowing people like Sweet Vet as a Jig Dog Ramage, Dusty Cleese, all these guys that sailed on the Big E. It was, it was incredibly cool. So. Yes, to answer your question. <laughs> but, you know, Enterprise has a, has a long and storied history. And, you know, it all starts, she actually, you know, she's one of the few pre-war carriers that we talk about that actually survives the war. There's, frankly, only three, uh, Ranger, Enterprise, and Saratoga. But um, Enterprise was a brand new design. She was, of course, a Yorktown class aircraft carrier, and, and Yorktown was built before Enterprise, and hence the Yorktown class. But these were ships that were developed in the mid 1930s, Bill, and, and they were really, with the exclusion of USS Ranger CV 4, these were the first American aircraft carriers designed from the keel up to be fleet carriers. Ranger was they tried to do that with Ranger, but it was just not a good design. Ship was too small. There's all kinds of things that went wrong with there. But but the Yorktown class, you know, were the stalwarts of the early Pacific War. And it all started in the mid-1930s. There mm -hmm. were some different things that went into her design, though, right, Bill? Yeah. And, you know, the Essex class that came later was, of course, the you know, powerhouse late in the war. But the, right. but the Yorktown class was, you know, built in the 1930s. The Yorktown, I think... The contract was given to Newport News Shipbuilding, which still exists under the name of Huntington Ingalls, by the way, in 1933. And those aircraft carriers, you know, CB-5 had their kill laid in, in 34 and 6, and I think 36. But again, they were all the, despite the fact they were built from the ground up as carriers, the very first ones that were, they were still restricted by the Washington Naval Treaty. So they were treaty carriers. Um, and we broke away from that later, but, but at this point, we're still trying to, one of the few countries are actually still trying to fall the restrictions laid on us by the aircraft carrier. Enterprise was launched with fanfare on October 30, 3rd, 1936, commissioned May 12th, 1938, taking her shakedown from 
Newport News shipbuilding to the Caribbean, and following her shakedown, a brief refit, she was ordered to the blue waters of the Pacific in 39, where she would spend nearly her entire life in the world's ocean. And Seth, it's interesting because my wife and I were in New York City just a couple of weekends ago, and we toured the Intrepid Museum while we were there. She'd never been aboard, and I wanted to bring her. And somebody asked one of the um, uh, one of the folks working, "Why is the this the Intrepid and not the Enterprise?" And the, I'm afraid the docent didn't know the answer. And I said, "Oh no. God, you you don't want to know the answer. <laughs> it's no, it should have been preserved, and it should have been there yes. or somewhere." But but it's sad that it's. I'm glad the Intrepid is there, better than nothing. But my goodness, this is the carrier that needed to be preserved. Oh my God, yes. Uh, you know, if there was any, if there was any one ship in the entire history of the United States Navy in World War II that deserved to be saved, it was the Big E. And you know, I, I don't remember the exact verbiage, but you know, it was said that you know, if there was, if there was one ship that that represented the United States Navy in World War II, it was the Enterprise, and that's that's the God's honest truth. And of course, you know, there were efforts that were made to save her, you know, through the 1950s. Actually, the main effort was led by none other than Admiral William F. Halsey. Halsey. Yeah. And uh, yeah, even Halsey could not get the funds that were needed to preserve this floating legend. And it's an mm -hmm. absolute travesty that this vessel is still not there to tour to see today because if i mean god love all the other world war ii naval vessels in this country and i've been on a great many of them but you could get rid of half of them and save enterprise it would be worth it i'll be honest to god but and that's just not me personally saying i think a lot of people would agree with that yeah, yeah. but uh you know as we say she had a pretty good history before world war ii and she actually you know she did a, a lot of different things and and, and in 39 and into 1941 she served uh big surprise here as the flagship of Admiral William F. Halsey. Halsey had a love affair with Enterprise too, uh, you know, it's starting from before the war all the way into 1940, well, 43, when he, you know, was uh, pulled ashore and then went with the big blue fleet. He, uh, he, he did serve, uh, he did fly his flag on Enterprise, I think once after that, but that early part of the war, Enterprise and Halsey were inseparable. They were tied at the hip, but uh, he became associated with her in, in, as I said, 1940 and 41, uh, where she was assigned to Cardiff 2. She was flagship of the Hawaiian department, or detachment rather, I'm sorry. Uh, she was earning her stripes, so to speak, as aviation was coming of age in the U.S. Navy. And, and you know, naval aviation had been a thing for a long time, but carrier aviation, the actual implementation of carrier aviation, the actual design of carrier tactics, the doctrine that that we talk about so often on this show, it was the at least, at least the early part of it was being written on the decks of Enterprise and Lexington CV2, you know, at that time out in the Pacific. And, you know, Enterprise along with her cousins, Saratoga and Lex were showing how aviation could affect any war that may come up in the Pacific. And I'm going to say this now, you know, people, Yorktown, Yorktown was in the Atlantic at this time. So, you know, there was a, there was a bit of a difference there, but mm -hmm. you know, Enterprise, uh, she first became famous of all places, Bill, in Hollywood, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah, she became a movie star in 40 and 41 in 1940. She was assigned along with her fighting squadron six to, to provide support for the, for the movie titled Flight Command, starring Robert Taylor, who was a huge movie star in those days. Mm -hmm. The following year, 1941, saw Enterprise have a starring role in Warner Brothers. Warner, Warner Brothers, by the way, from my hometown, Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, film Dive Bomber, starring Errol Flynn and the Big, Big E, right? It was shot in color, mm -hmm. and the film to this day is a gorgeous representation of pre-war U.S. naval aviation ashore and at sea. Now, replete with TBDs, F3Fs, SB2Us, N3Ns, <laughs> what the heck is that? F2A3s, and even a couple of BT-1s, again, what the heck is that? Seth's going to tell us in a minute. The dive bomber movie was a huge recruiting success for the Navy in the days just before the attack on Pearl Harbor, and several scenes were shot aboard Enterprise, who at this time was, was the flagship of Admiral Halsey, as it would remain for a long, long time. Rumor has it that Errol Flynn and Halsey 
did not get along, Seth. In fact, Halsey said to, to reported, and this may be a Hollywood myth, but reported telling Errol Flynn, huge movie star, this is like saying to Tom Cruise, Tom Cruise, Top Gun, get, off, get the hell off my ship. Well, that's what Halsey is reported to do with Errol Flynn during the filming of that movie. I have no idea what the heck Errol Flynn did to piss Halsey off so bad. Seth, do you know? I really don't know. And, and you know, I've seen the movie a gazillion times. And if you haven't seen it, check it out. The story itself is kind of silly, but the footage that's in this movie is ridiculously cool. And what mm -hmm. the hell Flynn did to, to irritate Bill Halsey is beyond me. Because apparently from, from everything I understood that Errol Flynn and the sailors aboard Enterprise got along famously. Like they, they were, you know, Flynn was a cool guy. The sailors, you know, they recognized that he was a cool cat, but he rubbed Halsey the wrong way. And the story goes, as, as you said, you know, he tells, uh, at, towards the, at the end of the filming, he says, you know, get the hell off my ship. And apparently Errol Flynn gives him the, uh, the bird, shall we say, and supposedly jumps overboard. Now I don't see Errol Flynn making a dive from the flight deck to the, to the water, Heck. but you never know who, knew, who the hell knows. Who Even knows. Errol Flynn can't get away with that. I guess not, but but the movie is really cool, and and you know you're talking about the planes that are in there. If if you want to see United States naval aviation pre Pearl Harbor and all its beauty and color, and these are the planes that you know have got the red tails or the yellow tails or the green tails or yellow wings and all kinds of different things. Are gorgeously colored airplanes. Now there's TBDs out the wazoo. The BT one, by the way, is the grandfather of the SBD. It's it's the granddaddy mm -hmm. of the Dauntless, and there's I think two in that movie and the N3N of course is what they call the instant eliminator. That's the yellow biplane that everybody flew uh, all the way through world war II, really. Yeah, but uh, it's a great movie and, and learn to fly on an N3N, I think. Yeah. I, I, most people did and, and yeah. during world war II, and, and the footage, the footage of, of enterprises is, is awesome. You know, she's, she looks, she looks pretty, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, enterprise was known as a happy ship, you know, both before and during the war guys I knew, and I knew a lot of them, as I said, always said she was a good feeder and bill, you being a sailor, you know, as well as I do that <laughs> food <laughs> is, is a primary, you know, uh, judgment of whether or not the ship is a good ship and enterprise was always known as a good feeder. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I got to say that my crews, my, my, when I was in CO, we won the best food in the Navy award. It's called the NEY -E award. And that probably did more to make my crew happy, the work up to the NEY, because you, you keep trying to get better so you can compete for this thing. Probably made my crew happier than any crew in, in, in the Navy. And so, yeah, it's a big yeah. deal. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it really is. And, and every single guy I knew, none of them ever complained about the Chow and Enterprise. They always said she had a good movie going all the time. She was clean. She was efficient. She was well run. She had good captains literally her entire career and was just mm -hmm. generally where you wanted to be, where you where whether you were a black shoe or an aviator, it did not matter. Enterprise had this gravitational pull to it that people just wanted to be aboard that ship, no matter who was in command. And so to that end, it shouldn't be a surprise that when guys were unfortunately transferred off for whatever reason, reassigned, whatever the case may be, they clamored, clawed, begged, pleaded, or stowed away sometimes, no, no lie, to get back aboard Enterprise. It was, it was that well loved by the people that sailed the border. And, you know, we're going to talk about this throughout these two episodes that we do on Enterprise, uh, but she was considered a leadership factory. You know, uh, the relationships between the officers and the enlisted men was almost always congenial and respectful. You know, officers who were pedants were almost always transferred off of the ship uh, throughout her entire service life. And for the most part, with the exception of the times when she got hit, life aboard Enterprise was usually a pretty damn good place to be. It was a good life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those those early pre-war years of the Pacific Fleet were, were almost idyllic. And then, you know, here comes December 7th, 1941. And Enterprise played a role, a pretty significant role in the attack on Pearl Harbor, at least during the events in the attack on Pearl Harbor. Bill, where was she on December 7th? Well, she was at sea. And of course, earlier in the week, she'd been delivering fighters to Wake Island. Rumors of war on the horizon were seemingly everywhere, and as such, Admiral Halsey had put his task force on a war footing, which is great. 
Remember, there was no surprise that war was about to begin. What the big surprise was, was where it began. Everybody thinking it was going to be in the Philippines, not Pearl Harbor. Everybody thinking that the Japanese don't have the capability to hit Pearl Harbor. But upon leaving Pearl Harbor on November 28th, Halsey issued battle order number one. He replaced training ammunition with service ammunition, and he instructed his sailors when put to the test, this is great, this is great stuff, by the way, when put to the test, yeah. all hands keep cool, keep your heads, and fight. In a conversation with the chief of staff, he quietly said, if anything gets in my way, we'll shoot first and argue afterwards, Seth. Yeah, that's that's like, you know, quintessential <laughs> William F. Halsey, right? There. It is, it is. But... Yeah, but he he was ready. He was he was no fool. You know, he knew that that Japan was stirring trouble. Obviously, to your point, Bill, he had no earthly clue that the Japanese were coming. But but he had a good idea that if something was going to go down, it was going to go down around them, and it was going to go down pretty soon. And but despite Halsey's apparitions or you know <laughs> inspirational feelings, whatever you want to call them, um, most men aboard Enterprise were not concerned. Uh, until Enterprise's mm -hmm. scouts took off bound for Pearl Harbor on December 7th. Uh, Halsey was irritated at being late coming into port. Now, Enterprise was actually due into Pearl Harbor on December the 6th, 1941. She was supposed to arrive in port that Saturday. There were guys that were getting set for Liberty. They were going to be in port in, on Liberty on Saturday night, on December 6th, 1941. So there were guys that were ready to rock and roll, get out there, go down to Hotel Street and, you know, take part in the uh, red light, shall we say. And, you know, th there were there were things that were uh, that entered into the conversation as to why Enterprise was late. And, you know, some people I've seen a lot of things recently in the last couple of years saying, oh, they you know they knew that's why they kept Enterprise out of port. That's malarkey. Enterprise and her task force ran into a storm. Uh, she ran into a storm. She was trying to fuel her, refuel her destroyers, or her her uh, plane guards and her escort destroyers as she was coming into port. And that storm delayed Enterprise from getting into port. Instead of arriving on the morning of December 6th, she was supposed to arrive on the afternoon of December 7th. And as we all know, things changed drastically on the morning of December 7th, 1941. The fact that Enterprise ran into that storm almost certainly saved her life because there's no doubt that the Japanese were going to target American aircraft carriers. That was the target uh, when they went into Pearl Harbor were the American aircraft carriers. They right. figured that Enterprise was going to be there. She was. She had a big bullseye on her. And by the grace of God, uh, CV-6 was not in Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Quite literally. Where was she, though, Bill? I, we, yeah. Right, yeah. She was a, yeah. about 225 miles out. Halsey not wanting any surprises in front of him. He said, well, let's launch the scouts. Why would he do that? But he did. It's incredible. Yeah. So 18 SBDs, mostly from VS-6, launched as a screen into Pearl. The flight was normal until CAG... Howard Young noticed AAA over the harbor. He also noticed aircraft up over Eva Field and assumed that the Army was up early, you know, but they was most certainly were not. Young was rudely introduced to the Japanese Zero when one strafed his tail and spit holes into his rudder with his 7.7s. The rest of his flight were not spared Japanese attention, Nearly all of the Enterprise SBDs were attacked by Japanese aircraft as they were coming into Pearl Harbor. Seven SBDs from Enterprise's flight would be shot down by enemy aircraft or friendly fire. Probably evenly split between those, but frankly. Eight men killed and a further two wounded would be the biggie's introduction into combat. Later that evening... Trigger happy man on the ground would shoot down three F four Fs from VF six. Seth, this mm -hmm. is terrible. Yeah, it really is. It, it is absolutely terrible, and it's a hell of a way to intro be introduced into a war. But I mean, it's no different than guys aboard USS Nevada. You know, same kind of a thing. They didn't know what the hell was going on either. And you know, there's there's all kinds of radio. There, uh, um, 
geez, transcripts of radio transmissions between Enterprises Aviators and the carrier that morning. And uh, if you want to read them, uh, look them up. They're there. They're out there on the internet. Look them up and read them. They're 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 rather fascinating. And when you read them, it's kind of hard not to be. I don't want to say you know alarmed, but you know what's going on mm-hmm. when you're reading this. And the guys that were sending these transmissions had no idea what the hell was going on. So it's it's, no, it's no, rather no. alarming. And if you want to but, believe the, I mean, the conspiracy nuts who believe that. Enterprise was held out because we knew Pearl Harbor was going to happen. Then why didn't they hold their planes back? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If they knew it was going to happen, exactly. why didn't they hold their planes back? They didn't know. And, and it's just wacky yeah. stuff. It is. It's foolishness. You know, but the one, one man who did indeed hear the uh, radio chatter was one Admiral William F. Halsey aboard Enterprise. Uh, he heard the excited radio chatter as Enterprise's you know, airmen are breaking radio silence, reporting the news of being attacked. Halsey, even though he had his fleet on a war footing, he'd issued battle order number one. He was almost kind of expecting something. Even Bill Halsey was going, what in the hell is going on? He was heard to holler, quote, tell Kimmel to stop shooting my boys, unquote. He thought that the Navy, our Navy, was shooting down his airplanes. Moments later, Halsey received a flash from Pearl, quote, this course, infamous, quote, air raid Pearl Harbor. This is no drill. At that, Halsey's orders GQ to be sounded and Enterprise's battle flag to be hoisted on her standard. Aloft in the air that morning was one of my very, very, very good friends, a guy named Don Hoff. Uh, Don was a radioman gunner in Scouting Squadron 6. He was actually supposed to be in that flight going to Pearl Harbor that morning. And in a matter of fact, the man that took his place, or rather the aircraft that took their place, got shot down and, every, and both of the pilot and the gunner were killed. Don's airplane that morning had a fouled spark plug or something like that, if I remember correctly. And, and he didn't, the airplane didn't have the power to take off, so they pulled it sent another aircraft in its place and that guy got shot down as i said and, and don's airplane was fixed and he and his pilot took off and they were out on that scouting mission uh he is a radio man so he's hearing all these transmissions over his radio and his and his dauntless and the entire time he's hearing this he i remember him telling me multiple times he's like we all thought it was fake we thought it was like orson wells and, and war of the worlds you know we thought it was not orson wells but uh yeah orson wells and, orson um, wells, huh? we, right yeah and, and we thought it was all just malarkey we thought it was all fake it was nothing but a drill when his dauntless is coming in to enterprise they made a they made a flyby they, they flew by the enterprise and he saw the battle colors flying from enterprise's standard and when he saw that he said quote when i saw that flag i knew it was real he said it was both awe-inspiring and terrifying at the same time we were at war he said he did not believe it until he saw that battle flag flying and he said to to his dying day that was the biggest flag he'd ever seen in his life and it was at the same time the most inspiring thing he'd ever seen and you know it was it was absolutely terrifying terrifying. yeah 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 yeah. because he was 17 just made 18 maybe at that time he was a kid young kid so this is all enterprise yeah, 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 it really is. I mean, I can't imagine being in that situation. I don't think very many people would have had a different reaction than Don did, frankly. Mm-hmm. So Enterprise is going to keep clear of Pearl for obvious reasons. <laughs> yeah. She keeps clear of Pearl un- until the following day. She enters port on the evening of December the 8th. Uh, well, as Halsey stands see, on the uh, flying bridge. Looking for the Japanese. Uh, was She, she just did. wasn't she standing did. out. She was actively trying to look for the Japanese, but at some point did have to come back in. And that was on December 8th. 100% correct. Mm-hmm. 100% correct. And to actually to, to dive into that comment you just made a little more deeply, um, she was ordered to send out uh, SBDs carrying smoke pots. No kidding. Smoke pots. And they were going to lay a smoke screen for the TBDs if they were to find the Japanese fleet. Um, and of course, as we all know, what happens to TBDs in the early part of the Pacific War, and we also knows, know what happens to SBDs in the early part of the Pacific War, they're the ship killers. But uh, such were the Navy's tactics on December 7th, 1941. So thank God, uh, Scouting 6 and Bombing 6 didn't find Kyudu Butai on December 7th, 1941. So as Big E pulls in the Pearl, um, Halsey's on the flying bridge, and this is a a famous statement, and he's standing there and he's looking, surveying the wreckage of the Pacific fleet, and he's heard to cuss and almost spit the words, quote, by the time I'm finished with them, 
the Japanese language will only be spoken in hell, unquote. So Halsey was a bit miffed, shall we say, at what had happened to his Pacific fleet. Men ashore yelled at Enterprise sailors who lined the deck saying, quote, you better get out of here or the bastards will nail you too, unquote. And Enterprise did just that, Bill. She stayed in Pearl long enough to refuel, reprovision, and receive orders. She was gone, back at sea, seven hours after tying up at 1010 Pier, patrolling the Hawaiian coast for another Japanese attack that was expected at any time. You know, mm-hmm. and Enterprise makes a lot of firsts in her career, and this is one of the firsts in the Pacific War that she makes one of the next actions she does, isn't it, Bill? Yeah, it is. Um, you know, she's going to exact some revenge, even though it was, you know, in, in the grand scheme, just a pinprick when an SBD right. from her VS-6, you know, you know, piloted by Clarence Dickinson, sank the Japanese submarine I-70 on December 10th, 1941. Another kind of factoid that's lost to history, not to historians, historians, mm-hmm. <laughs> but most people don't remember that they know about the sunken midget submarines on December 7th, but they did, don't they forget that I-70 was sunk on December 10th. And this was the first Japanese man of war to be sunk by the U.S. Navy in general, and of course, by the Enterprise as well. But it most certainly would not be the last set. Back yeah, so, you know, sinking of this, the sinking of submarines is always very, very hard to confirm. But this sinking by Dickinson on December 10th is confirmed. It's confirmed by the United States Navy and by the Imperial Japanese Navy at the same time. So it's one of those things, it's one of those one of those few sinkings that is able to be confirmed that this cat was the first one to sink a Japanese man of war and he flew from the decks of Enterprise. Now, Bill, we did an episode, one of our first episodes we ever did back in season one was on the hit and run carrier raids in 1942. Mm-hmm. And you know, a lot of that episode centered on Enterprise and for good reason, because she was still the flagship of Admiral William F. Halsey and Enterprise and Halsey and Enterprise Air Group executed the first offensive actions against the Japanese in the Pacific in 1942 in the hit and run raids on February 1st, 1942 at the Marshall Islands. Um, Bill, the, the, the raid, and you know, if anybody wants super, super detail on those raids, go listen to our episode in season one on that. But, you know, as I said, she conducted the first offensive operation against Japan uh, when aircraft from her flight deck struck Japanese mm-hmm. holdings in the Marshall Islands, hitting targets on Wochi, Malaya Lap, and Kwajalein, which is targets we just talked about here with John uh, McManus a couple weeks ago. A total of 64 aircraft from Enterprise struck back at the Japanese. Uh, you know, Halsey told his pilots on CV-6 that they would stay all day and, quote, raise a little hell in the Marshall Islands. And his pilots were elated, Bill. They, they, they had taken a beating. You know, the Navy had taken a serious hit in the morale department. And this was the first strike back at the Japanese. This was a huge morale builder, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. I mean, just a few weeks after Pearl Harbor, uh, February 1st, a couple of months. But the, um, and again, we don't want to confuse this with the major action that occurred in 1944 with a whole bunch of aircraft carriers and one of Nimitz's finest hours in overriding his staff and directing the action when his staff wanted to go in a different direction. But watch that episode if you want to, if you want to hear more about that. But this is the hit and run raids in season one we talked about. In this case, hey, we're going to raise a little hell was Halsey's statement. And in this, in CV-6 launched 37 SBDs and nine TBDs armed with bombs. Um, Scouting Squadron six, at 6 was to attack the airfield Bombing Squadron 6 was to freelance and attack targets of opportunity. As VS-6 approached, remember the 6 is because they're launching from CV-6, the Enterprise. So in those days, that's the way the squadrons were named. They were named after the ship's hull number. But as VS-6 approached Roy Island, Japs, the Japanese scrambled fighters, Type 96 clods, and then the AAA started sprouting up as the SBDs went into their glide bombing runs. And VS-6 CO Halstead was hopping, Halstead Hopping's SBD is jumped by the clods and is hit by AAA. He drives directly, dives, drives directly into the drink. And Mm -hmm. does he survive, Seth? 
No, he does not. He and his gunner were both killed in action. And, you know, it's it's interesting. You just said that, and we're not going to dive too deeply into this because we've already done that. But I want to make one point here. You said that they drive, that they glide, they, that they go into their glide bombing runs, which is 100 percent accurate. That was the tactic of this particular squadron leader, uh, not to, you know, speak ill of the dead, but he, he was uh, less than adventurous shall we say. Uh, he was, he was greatly beloved by his men, but he, he did not utilize the SVD and it's at its fullest potential. Uh, however, when he is killed in action, God rest his soul, uh, his XO takes command of scouting six. And it's a guy who you're going to hear a lot about through the early part of the Pacific war a guy named Earl Gallagher. Gallagher is a new breed of cat. You know, he's, he's a new squadron leader now literally brand new squadron leader but he's a younger man he knows what the dauntless can do after they go into their glide bombing runs and and they make a second attack scouting six goes in and gallagher is leading the squadron and they execute they use the dauntless to its finest execution they roll in at 70 and 80 degree dives so he's a dive bomber pilot he knows what the hell to do um there's a couple people that emerge from this raid Earl Gallagher being one, obviously. Another one is a guy you hear a lot about in the first six months of the war, a personal friend of mine, uh, Dusty Cleese, Norman Jack Dusty Cleese. Uh, Dusty was an SBD pilot in Scouting 6. He was, at, he was a JG at the time, so he'd been around a while. Uh, also an Academy graduate class in 1938. And um, Dusty is one of these people, um, Dick Best is another that, or was another, that was just a dead eye you know they were dauntless pilots they were dive bomber pilots they knew how to fly that plane they knew how to aim that bomb and they never missed and dusty cleese's first time dropping ordnance on a japanese vessel is here in the marshall islands and he smacks a japanese light cruiser with his bomb and it's not the first time i mean it is the first time but it's not the last time that Dusty Cleese is going to make his mark literally on the Japanese fleet. He's going to get a second chance at Midway. Um, VS-6 comes in for a second attack. Uh, they gain a bunch of altitude and circle to come around uh, around the island again, uh, initially hitting shipping that was initially hit by uh, bombing squadron six. Um, as I said, they're coming in now at 70 degree dives and they're actually hitting their targets. Uh, Dusty drops a 500 pounder on a vessel thought to be a cruiser, as I said. Uh, he hits this thing dead center. Uh, he roars across across Kwajalein, strafing the airfield as he goes. John Snowden is his rear seat gunner. Snowden grabs his single 30 caliber machine gun. They didn't have the twin 30s in the SBDs at this time. Uh, he grabs his single 30 and starts spraying uh, Japanese sailors as they're running across the the uh, tarmac there on Kwajalein. Uh, other aircraft hit many of the ships in the harbor, including a subtender and a submarine. Um, you know, this is something that 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 Enterprise plays a huge role in, Bill, for the next six months is that her pilots, they're obviously they're not the only ones, but her pilots are seeing a lot of action at the beginning of the war. You know, there's Marshall Islands raids. Um, there's another attack up by Enterprise Air Group here that you can talk about in a second on Taroa. You know, these guys are getting in their their experience early. So when the big show does come here on June 4th, 1942, a lot of these guys that survived these raids make a lot of, they inflict a lot of damage on the Japanese, but we'll get to that in a second. The, the, the second attack by Enterprise Air Group uh, on Taroa, Bill, that, that's, it, it leaves Enterprise exposed to retaliatory strikes from the Japanese. Um, the attack on Taroa was contested hotly by Japanese aircraft and AAA. Um, the AAA wasn't very accurate, but it was heavy. At this point, Halsey is advised by one of his subordinates to basically get the hell out of here. Uh, Bill, what, what, what happens here after this? Yeah, they, they, they set, he did the raise, the raise hell part, right? Now it's time to get the hell out of here. CV-6 is pulling away at flank speed. She's attacked by Japanese nail level bombers, not dive bombers, but level bombers. B's AAA guns start to bark at the incoming bombers and combat air patrol engaged, but made no discernible impact. That's incredible. So the Japanese release ordnance from around 3,000 feet and Captain George Murray handles the Big E like a speedboat. 
expertly dodging the incoming ordnance. And one last Nell, damaged by Enterprise's AAA, turns around and heads back towards the ship. Pilot Lieutenant Kazuo Nakai intends on crashing his Nell into the Big E. And then what happens with a gentleman named Bruno Guido? I, we did talk about this in a previous episode, Seth, but it's worth covering again. Absolutely, it is. It's it's one of the legendary stories of the early part of the Pacific War. Guido was a, uh, a an aviation radioman, I believe, and uh, he was assigned to Scouting Squadron Six. He had never flown any combat missions before. He'd flown in SBDs before. He'd taken rides in the backseat of a Dauntless. He knew what to do, um, but he'd never seen the elephant, so to speak. Uh, as this Nell is coming in to very obviously crash aboard Enterprise, you know this is one of the first instances of a intentional suicide run by a Japanese pilot in the Pacific War, certainly not the last. Uh, Guido sees what's going to happen, and he sees Enterprise's AAA firing at this target, and they're hitting it, but the damn thing isn't going down, and he feels like he needs to do something. So he's standing on the flight deck, and he runs clear across the flight deck, jumps in the rear seat of an SBD that's parked uh, on the fantail of Enterprise, grabs the 30 caliber machine gun out of the rear seat and spins it around and just hoses this airplane down as it's coming in. Now, you know, these airplanes, uh, the SBDs were equipped, the, especially the rear seat guns were equipped with tracer ammunition. As they say, tracers point both ways, but every third round was a tracer. So everyone on Enterprise could see that his rounds were indeed hitting this Japanese nail. Uh, he's pouring fire into the cockpit. He's firing directly into the cockpit. Now, whether or not he hits the pilot, kills the pilot, nobody knows. But this airplane screams towards Enterprise, and at the last second, it veers over his wingtip of the Japanese Nell, cuts the tail off of Guido's SBD that he's still sitting in, mind you, and catches the after end of the flight deck, Cater, uh, catapults into the ocean, explodes and shrapnel all over the Enterprise. There's a small fire that is set that's quickly put out, but it's the first time Enterprise is actually hit, although it's a glancing blow. But Guido's action almost certainly saves Enterprise from getting hit by this Japanese Nell level bomber. And it, it's portrayed in the movie Midway, the, the most recent one. Mm -hmm. And the way it's portrayed is actually pretty damn close to the way it happened. Um, again, my good friend, Dusty Cleese was standing on the flight deck, watching all of this go down. He watched Bruno Guido run over and do this whole thing. So, you know, the way it's shown in the movie is actually the way it actually happened, which can't be said for a lot of movies, but it's one of the, one of the legendary stories of, of the Pacific war. And it's 100% true. Absolutely mm -hmm. true. And we're talking about the 2019 Midway, not the 1976 Midway. Yeah, correct. That's great. Correct. All right. Yeah. 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 So launching strikes for the better part of the day, 14 hours on 158 strikes to be exact. Enterprise aircraft inflicted minor dam physical damage on the Japanese, but provided an invaluable lift for sagging morale within the U.S. Navy. What the air raids, all of them do is provide the air crews of Enterprise Air Group with invaluable experience. Now, before we jump into the next bit here, Seth, I think I want to make, there are two important points to take away from this. You made the point that Enterprise was a leadership school. It was that, mm -hmm. absolutely, 100%. It was also a tactical development school, school yes. for the aircraft. And, and in Navy language, we speak about type model series, TMS. Type model series means the SPDs are going to learn different lessons than the TBDs. And, but the lessons that the type model series, SPD, type model series, TBD, are going to be different and need to be passed down the line to that type of aircraft crew man going forward. So these are little schoolhouses for each type model series of airplane to help as the tactics that are being developed at work. And as you see your friends get shot down and, or fail in their mission and get killed that don't work. And those go back to the schoolhouses for that type model series because pilots for SPDs go to SPD school, pilots for TV. So it's being passed that way. So there's a 
tactical schoolhouse that enterprise is becoming. But the third point, oh, yeah. and this might even be the most important point, and I don't think we've ever made this point before, Seth. In the early days of aircraft carriers, they were treated like landing strips on ships, right? So they were treated no different than Army, Air Corps, Air Forces, landing strips, just happened to be on ships and were mobile. The notion that you could develop combat tactics for the platform, not just the airplane that flies off the platform, but the platform, that, that wasn't obvious. That wasn't like something that people thought of from day one. Those aircraft fighting the aircraft carrier, not just fighting the airplanes, the notion emerged over the 30s and those tactics and strategies for how to fight the ship, not just how to fight the planes that fly off the ship. Enterprise was like leading the way in all of that. And initially it was just how to fight one aircraft carrier. And over the course of the war, it became how to fight groups of aircraft carriers, which the Japanese and the Kyoto Butai were initially way ahead of us in as sure. midway you know, kind of demonstrated we end up winning anyway. But, you know, certainly Pearl Harbor, Midway, the Japanese were already figuring out cycle times and, and how to cycle the flight decks and things like that. We had to figure all that out. And again, Enterprise was a developmental platform for everything from basic military leadership to tactical utility of each type model series that flew off of its flight decks to fighting aircraft carriers themselves. And that is so important as we go into what came next, Seth, and what was that? Well, the, the, what came next is a little raid called the Doolittle Raid. And I know, you know, we've never done an episode on the Doolittle Raid, and we will, we will do. I mean, you got to, you know, we just, we skipped over it because we wanted to get to other important things. But Surprise, surprise, surprise. Enterprise is also a part of the Doolittle Raid. Uh, she leaves Pearl Harbor on April the 8th, 1942. Uh, at this time, Enterprise is embarking Saratoga's beached bombing squadron, VB-3. Now, those uh, astute viewers will and listeners will remember that Saratoga sucked up her first torpedo of the war in January of 1942. So she's laid up. She's on the, she's on the West Coast being repaired right now. And her air group, Air Group 3, or Saratoga Air Group, as it would be called, was uh, on the beach. And Scouting Squadron 6 had absorbed a lot of heavy casualties uh, in the hit-and-run raids. Uh, they had by far taken the heaviest beating of any Enterprise squadron, uh, and they were put ashore for a rest and you know, basically replenishment of human beings. At that time, uh, Enterprise needed another uh, die bombing squadron aboard her flight deck and that happened to be bombing squadron three vb3 uh, they came in and uh, spelled vs6 while they were being uh, refreshed with people so enterprise leaves pearl harbor as i said on april the 8th uh, sailing for god knows where for three days in gloomy weather you know scuttlebutts going all over the place uh, until on the morning of april the 12th 1942 when the sun rises the men aboard enterprise site USS Hornet, her sister on the horizon, her deck stacked with Army B-25 Mitchells. Uh, men aboard Enterprise assumed that they were an escort for a ferry mission. They assumed that Hornet was going to ferry these B-25s to, you know, Midway or who the hell knows where. And Enterprise was just there to escort the Hornet. And they were there to escort the Hornet, but to an entirely different destination, Bill. Uh, all wonder was cleared up when Halsey gets on the ship's PA and announces, quote, this force is bound for Tokyo, unquote. Pandemonium erupts aboard Enterprise when they find out, oh my God, we're actually going to hit the enemy in their own backyard. Mm. The electrifying moment. Yeah. Um, forgive me for this, Seth, but I'm going to use every opportunity to do things like this and point out that the whole idea of launching B-25s off of an aircraft carrier came from a submariner back in the <laughs> That's right. That's right. It did. <laughs> yep. So anyway, it was a very successful raid, of course, being what it was. 
It didn't do a heck of a lot of damage, but just like the hit and run raids in the Marshalls, it was scene setting. I mean, it was it was the signal for the Japanese that, yeah, just like the large ocean hasn't protected Hawaii, that same large ocean is not going to protect Japan. So, you know, absolutely, you're getting some of your own back at you. And that was a wonderful morale builder, not just for um, army and naval personnel, but for all Americans. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the, the dual rate affects a lot more than, than, than we want to think, you know, and we'll get into that. As I said, we'll do, we'll do an episode on the dual rate. Hell, I don't know, maybe this season, maybe next season, God knows, but we'll, we'll do an episode on the dual rate for sure. And mm-hmm. we'll, we'll really dig into what it actually does. hundred percent. You're correct. The physical damage is negligible at best, but it affects not only American morale, but Japanese understanding and plans that lead to other very, 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 very important things. Um, So after returning to Pearl, uh, Bill, Enterprise is in desperate need of a refit, but with no time to do it, and I mean no time to do it, she sails again for battle, this time bound for the Coral Sea. Uh, Again, she's under the command of Admiral William Halsey. Uh, CV-6 and CV-8 race for the Coral Sea and arrive too late to participate in the battle. Coral Sea is the only major battle in the entire Pacific War from 1941 to 45 that Enterprise would miss. Think about that for one second. Think of all the battles, everything we've just already talked about and everything you know that's coming from Midway to Santa Cruz to Eastern Solomons to Phil Sea and on and on and on and on and on. Coral Sea is the only one that Enterprise misses. <laughs> that's how that's she took the record really of battle stars, right? I and mean, then that's exactly yeah. how she took the record. She made every battle minus one. That's incredible. Yeah. It's incredible when you think about it. It really is. So, so Bill, she gets back to Pearl. You know, she goes out to the Coral Sea, and there's a whole you know, story there. But, but she gets out to Coral Sea. There's frankly nothing for her to do, and she turns around. She heads back to Pearl. Bill, what? Uh, what, what happens next? I think Nimitz even took a, a motor whaleboat and met the ship before it tied up when it comes back. Um, he hands out awards for the hit and run raids and then gives a short pep talk uh, that are things that have to be done in short order. And those yeah. things, this, you know, what are those things? It is the battle that we, you know, took at the time we we recorded this in season one, we thought, wow, we're spending a lot of episodes on the Battle of Midway. And then we did Guadalcanal and blew that completely out of the water. But Guadalcanal, <laughs> six months. Midway only lasted a few days, right? So the importance of the air group, its experience, some of the things that went right for the Enterprise and went wrong. And then, it, mm-hmm. you know, the, the incredible thing, I hope the thing that besides our, our victory, that people, our listeners and viewers, take out of our discussion about Midway were the names. And what are some of those names, Seth? Well, you know, I mean, if you look, if you look at Midway from, from the 40,000-foot view, you know, and we're not going to get into the whole battle because we've done that ad nauseum with, you know, three episodes with John, and, and, and go back and listen to that, and that's fine. But, but Enterprise plays... And I'm, I'm, I know we're probably going to get pushback on this when I say this, but it's the truth. Enterprise plays the most important role of any United States Navy ship in that battle. And then people are going to say Yorktown, Yorktown, Yorktown. No doubt, Yorktown played a heavy role. Yorktown's air group sank, well, her SBDs sank the carrier Soryu. But SBDs that flew from the flight deck of USS Enterprise sank the other three. <laughs> so, so, I mean, it, it's a pretty significant tilting of the scales here. Um, you know, it's, it's, there, there were names that were aboard Enterprise from Midway that are direct reasons why we were successful at Midway. The first one that comes to mind is Wade McCluskey, you know, and I've said this during that episode and I'll say it till my dying day. If Wade McCluskey is not CAG for Air Group 6, for Enterprise Air Group at this time, we do not win the Battle of Midway period. It does not happen. It does not happen. Well, uh, let me rephrase that. It does not happen the way that we know it happens. Um, McCluskey 
is, you know, he's a former F4F Wildcat pilot. He's been promoted up to CAG, you know, because of the losses having been suffered during the hit and run rates. Uh, this he is his first. He learns SPD, right? Yes, he does. Yeah. And he flies the SPD like a fighter, you know, throttle mm -hmm. to the firewall the whole damn time, which winds up causing issues for the guys back at the tail end of the uh, of the formation. And we'll get to the issues with Enterprise and her and her uh, her her squadrons in just a second. We'll talk about the positives first. And, you know, but McCluskey's decision to continue the search for Kido Butai, even when he reaches the point of interception and there's nothing there, you know, I just want people, and I say it all the time, but I want people to think about this. And this is a guy who had, he's an early naval aviator, but he spent a lot of time aboard Enterprise. He'd been aboard Enterprise since Pearl Harbor. You know, so, I mean, this is an Enterprise aviator. This is a guy who grew up in the bowels of Scout, of a CV-6. He's an Enterprise man through and through and always would be till his dying day, by the way. But the weight of the entire battle is hanging on this guy's shoulders if he does not find the Japanese fleet. And he knows that. He's got 31 other SBDs behind him that can deliver the killing blows to these Japanese carriers if he can find them. And the fact that he, granted, the fact that he makes that turn is on him. And the fact that he sees the Japanese destroyer below him is frankly providence, in my opinion. But the way he puts two and two together and says, this guy's going here, I'm going to follow him despite the fact that I know that half my people behind me are going to run our fuel, we got to do something here. And of course, you know, we all know the rest of the story, but it's Wade McCluskey that changes the tipping point of that battle. Because even if Yorktown's people get there, and of course they do, and they hit Soryu and they destroy Soryu, without scouting six and bombing six, and we'll talk about Dick Best and Dusty Cleese and Earl Gallagher in just a second, there's only one carrier burning, not three, at 1022 on the morning of June 4th, 1942. So it really is Enterprise that tips the scales. It's Wade McCluskey that does it. And behind him, he's got, you know, a bevy of talent. You know, these are the guys, Bill, that we were just talking about that had cut their teeth, some of them flying in the Pearl Harbor on December 7th, some of them looking for the Japanese fleet on December 7th. And then the other ones are cutting their teeth, flying over the Marshall Islands and all the hit and run raids and all this other stuff. So these guys are combat experienced, without a doubt, you know, considering all the other squadrons, be they bombing three and, you know, Hornets people, Enterprise's squadrons, specifically six, uh, scouting six and bombing six, are easily the most experienced squadrons in the air that morning, by far, and it's not even close. And they show it because of the pounding that is put on Kaga by Earl Gallagher, who scores the first hit on a Japanese aircraft carrier at the Battle of Midway. And then by my old buddy, Dusty Cleese, who drills Kaga with his first bomb and then drills here you later on in the afternoon with his second bomb, you know, and then of course there's Dick Best who, you know, realizes the confusion in the air. And, and, and again, we'll get to the negatives in a second, but the, you know, he, 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 pulls out of his dive on Kaga, grabs two guys and goes down on Akagi. And he's the only one that hits Akagi mm -hmm. and winds up causing devastation that leads to her scuttling by the Japanese. So all these guys are flying off of Enterprise. And of course, Dick Best makes a hit on Hear You in the afternoon, just like Dusty Cleese does. So, I mean, these guys are all flying from the, you know, Douglas Fir blue stain flight deck of Enterprise. And they, as you always say, move the needle on the morning of June 4th, 1942. They really do. They do. And you know, we, I regret that to do for Hollywood to make a movie about, uh, make a movie about real events, special, a war movie. They have to focus on one personality, one character. Otherwise the audience loses interest. And the 2019 Midway movie, that person is Dick Best, a little bit of weight sure. plusty. And then the other guys are kind of in the dust somewhere. That is regrettable. However, and, and the bit at the end of the movie where Dick Best lands way after he would have been in the drink, run out of fuel, that part is, right. is just melodrama fiction. Uh, having said that, that movie does the best job of any of them that have come out about the battle to properly represent the heroism that went into the battle. And a little bit of the personality okay. exaggerated from, from Hollywood reasons, um, you know, the, the Dick Best's injury in the air from the uh, impure oxygen mixture, all true, all that never flew again, all true. And so it's worth seeing how these guys did not end up 
with the Medal of Honor, I will never know, Seth. I don't either. You know, and if there's if there's one guy, there's only one uh, aviator who is awarded the Medal of Honor at Midway, and it's, it's a Marine uh, flying because mm-hmm. he, he he drives his uh, wind indicator. Yeah, uh-huh. and yeah. he drives his wind indicator into a Japanese cruiser on the sixth. But uh, th- none uh, of the tail hookers uh, from Enterprise or Yorktown are recognized with the nation's highest honor. And frankly, in my opinion, if there was one who deserved it, it was absolutely, without a doubt, Commander Wade McCluskey Jr. Mm-hmm. He should have gotten that medal. But pff, whatever it is, what it is, everybody knows what he did, and that's the most important part. But you know. Again, you know, we talk about the positives that Enterprise did, and and so and to be clear, you know, she's a ship that is helmed and and you know, crewed by human beings who are not perfect, and there are things that go down at Midway, and we're going to see again later that you kind of scratch your head and you go, "What the hell is going on?" Because in the early part of forty two, there wasn't this well in forty two period, there wasn't this personnel rotation that you see later on in the war. So a lot of the guys that are aboard during the Marshall Islands raids that are, you know, making Enterprise look like a friggin' conveyor belt. They're spitting out strikes so fast are the same cats that are aboard the ship at Eastern Solomons in August of 1942, where it's just a cluster. And, and mm-hmm. you know, there's Enterprise issues here at Midway where, you know, her air group does not congeal. You know, her torpedo planes strike before the dive bombers do. And the fighters are basically non-existent. Jim Gray, <laughs> CF-6... Yeah, yeah, they're nowhere to be found. You know, they don't do a damn thing. Uh, a lot, frankly, a lot of the blame for the the uh, devastation of VT six is laid on Jim Gray's uh, fighting six, and it's right, it's correct. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole different there's a whole kettle of fish there that needs to be investigated, and maybe we'll do that at a later date. But then, you know, there's Wade McCluskey, who is, in my opinion, the hero of the Battle of Midway, but he screws up the dive. On Kaga, you know, he's supposed to split, you know, once his squadron or rather uh, VS6 is supposed to go after Akagi. And, you know, it's all this other. It's it's just a, it's a cluster there. And, and Dick through the Bu- grace Best, of God. Dick, Dick and Best, Yeah, Dick Best makes an yeah. adjustment to fix it, right? Yeah, exactly. If it wasn't for Dick Best, Akagi escapes. And, mm-hmm. you know, of course, obviously Dick Best, you know, punches it out and knocks it out. So, I mean, there are issues that happen there with enterprise. And, and, you know, like you said, Bill, you just said it just a few minutes ago, she's cutting her, her teeth too. And, you know, she wasn't perfect. She was a schoolhouse. She was the leadership factory, but these are human beings and human beings do make mistakes. And unfortunately, some of those mistakes, well, most more often than not mistakes like that in wartime cost lives. And this is no different. Uh, enterprise suffers heavy losses in the battle of Midway. Uh, 22 pilots and 22 gunners are lost. And that includes dive bombers and torpedo bombers. Um, you know, I believe two or three uh, VT-6 TBDs returned from their strike, and they're, all of them are shot up. And, mm-hmm. you know, Scouting-6, again, takes a beating. Bombing-6 takes a beating. And by the end of the day, on June 4th, you know, they're combining Scouting-6 and Bombing-6 into one squadron, and they're absorbing VB-3 because Yorktown's disabled. So, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that go on there. Go listen to our other three episodes. But... Um, you know, but again, I, I say this at the beginning and I'll say it again. If Enterprise isn't there, Midway doesn't turn out the way it does. If Wade McCluskey doesn't do what he does, Midway does not turn out the way it does. And while Yorktown certainly played an important role, Enterprise was the tipping point here, too. You there? I'm still here. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I got you. I thought I lost you for a second. Mm-hmm. So after Midway, Bill, uh, you know, again, there, there's a break. There's a pause of about a month-ish. And then Admiral Ernest King decides, you know, he wants to light a fire under the U.S. Pacific Fleet and invade a little place called Guadalcanal. Um, yeah. Enterprise being, again, one of the only cares still around. And after having lost Lexington, Saratoga is still laid up. Or actually, now Saratoga is out of the yard. And Yorktown's down. The Big E's around, and she plays a huge role in the Guadalcanal mm-hmm. campaign, Bill. She does. You know, and parenthetically, since you mentioned King, I'm noticing in the comments, despite our full-throated defense of Admiral King's strategy for the Pacific War, we got some King haters among our commenters, yeah, don't we? <laughs> but he was, here he was sticking his neck out, saying we need to go to Guadalcanal, getting the JCS approval to do it, you know, when 
to, by, by all logical analysis, we weren't ready. And it works out. And of course, as you said, Enterprise along with Walston, Saratoga are right there. And as we said a hundred times, Guadalcanal, not Midway, is the turning point in the Pacific War. And so and Enterprise is in the middle of both. So they're in the middle of the turning point, whichever religion you, you uh, ascribe to <laughs> as turning points go. And so, you know, Enterprise role in the early stages of the campaign, they could provide an air cover for the landings and protection of the fleet in the first few days. They, you know, they're all in the, under the overall command of Fletcher. And you could disagree with Fletcher's decision to withdraw, later Kincaid and Halsey, you know, with, to withdraw and strand the Marines, Turner taking the other, you know, surface combatants out of the fight after the Marines get ashore. Watch our episodes on Guadalcanal where we cover all that. But, but the point yeah. is, Enterprise is in the middle of all of this. She is. And, you know, it's, it's her pilots, it's, it's her air group that provide that, well, um, her and Wasp, provide that initial cover for the landing forces as they're going ashore on August 7th. It's her SBDs that wind up getting jumped by a guy named Saburo Sakai, uh, you know, who uh, gets basically an eye shot out by, by a rear seat gunner and an SBD from Bombing Squadron 6. Uh, you know, all off the flight deck of the Enterprise. Enterprise is hanging around off the shores of Guadalcanal from August 7th, 1942 until the friggin' end, even though she takes some seriously heavy licks here in the future. Um, the, 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 the fact that the, the American aircraft carrier forces are off the shores of Guadalcanal is one thing, but the fact that they consistently get whittled down to almost nothing makes this, in my opinion, and we're only going to cover in this episode up till 1943 of Enterprise's history because it's so damn long, but the fact that she still is hanging around through all of this, through all of the mishaps that come through August at Eastern Solomons and, of course, at Santa Cruz, you know, th this is some serious skins on the wall for guys who are aboard Enterprise at this time. And, and she, again, like Midway, where she was the tipping point, she is the tipping point here at Guadalcanal at the turning point of the war. Bill, the first carrier battle after Midway, the third carrier battle of World War II, Eastern Solomons, sees mm -hmm. Enterprise right smack dab in the middle of it here again, too. This is on August 22nd, 1942. Uh, Enterprise is at the front end of this thing again here, too, isn't he? Again, yeah. And this is actually a really good high levels, you know, kind of a, what do we used to call them? Um, the the short compendium of a book. If you don't want to read the book, you you read the cliff, cliff notes. notes. We're doing a cliff yeah. notes today of all these various battles and the Eastern Sa Solomon's Enterprise scouts are the first to put a fix on the Japanese on a Japanese carrier that morning and track the target. SBD pilot Bernie Strong, remember him, relays the sighting to the incoming strike from Saratoga. Further sightings by Enterprise scouts do relay target information to incoming strikes from Sarah. Sarah, yes, the torpedo magnet, Sarah. Penny packet, <laughs> yeah. penny packet strikes by Enterprise airmen in their SBDs do virtually nothing except annoy the Japanese. And for all the good that Enterprise and her air group had done previous to Eastern Solomons, they don't lay heavy hits on the targets here. The reason for this could and possibly were, were the introduction of a great many new faces and rookies. Now, again, we talked about this before. Unlike the Japanese, when we got experienced pilots with combat action and victories and know how to win, know how to beat the enemy, one of the first, we started rotating those guys back to the schoolhouses so they could teach the right way. Instead of, you know, keep doing the same thing with the same guys, we need to build our portfolio, our, our, our bench mm -hmm. of people who yep. could do these things. The only way to do that is to teach these tactics at the schoolhouse. So we were rotating people off, new faces showing up on the Big E, early war, and, and these new faces were making, unfortunately, some of the same mistakes because a lot of them hadn't been taught by these enterprise veterans because they had just rotated back and these were their replacements. So as those 
guys that rotated back are teaching the next generation, the third wave, you could think of it that way, of pilots. The right way to do things, the second wave, was screwing things up. Now, that's, that's a little harsh, I guess, Seth. Yeah. No, I, I, I would not disagree with you there. I mean, you know, to, to your point, um, a lot of the squadrons aboard Enterprise had been gutted after Midway. And, and by gutted, I mean gutted. Like Earl Gallagher was gone. Dick Best medically was gone. Dusty Cleese was gone. Don Hoff, the rear seat gunner, he was gone. You know, all these guys, Lou Hopkins, he had been reassigned to another squadron. Lou Hopkins was in bombing squadron six. Now he's on Hornet. So, I mean, they're, you know, these guys had been scattered to the four winds and exactly to your point, most of them had been sent home to teach the guys coming out. This is how you kill Japanese carriers or Japanese zeros, as the case may be, whatever, whatever it is, it is. But the guys that are now filling the ranks of fighting six, bombing six, and torpedo three, VT three, had be re, had been reconstituted after Midway, after their debacle flying from Yorktown and, and their slaughter at the hands of the Japanese. They're back aboard Saratoga, but at this time at Eastern Solomon, Saratoga had had. Uh, their, their air groups were starting to be intermingled all over the different carriers. VT-3 was uh, aboard Enterprise now, and VS-5, Scouting-5, which is originally a Yorktown unit, is now aboard Enterprise. It starts to get confusing after a while. But again, these guys had not seen a lot of combat, or in the case of some of these squadrons, had not seen any combat at all. And exactly to your point, Bill, the guys that had been pulled out of Bombing-6 and Scouting-6 and places like that, they were home and they kind of passed each other, you know, in the wind going, going to and from, and they were not able to give that vital experience information to these new guys. So there were a lot of mistakes made. And Bernie Strong is, he's probably, you know, one of the outliers to this because he was just a badass all the way around. But, and there always are going to be those guys, but by and large, the majority of these squadrons at this time were filled with green pilots, or if they weren't green, they'd flown maybe one combat mission, maybe. So, so that experience level was not there at this time. And, and, it, and, and you see that. You, you really do. You see that. Max Leslie, who is a, a legend in the Pacific War, he's CAG of Enterprise now. Wade McCluskey's back home. So, and Lex, Leslie is a fantastic leader, was a fantastic leader, but he was not the type of leader that Wade McCluskey was. He wasn't the firebrand that Wade McCluskey was. Wade McCluskey was a, a leader uh, by example, Max Leslie was a quiet leader. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but sometimes you new guys need somebody to, to get in their face. And, and Max yeah. Leslie was not that kind of a guy, but Bill Eastern Solomon's for enterprise is not remembered by what her air group did. It's by, it's remembered by what the Japanese did to enterprise though. And that's the point of this part of this story is that Eastern Solomon's it's, it's not about the air group. This is about the ship, and this is where Enterprise takes a beating here, Bill. Yeah, unfortunately, I think it was around 1632 when the radar aboard uh, CV-3 reports many bogeys range 88 miles bearing 320. So Enterprise and her compatriot launch every fighter available to repel the attack they know is inbound. 55 F4F Wildcats or aloft to repel the attack and that now appears to be heading directly for the B Big E. Enterprise is also screened by two cruisers, six destroyers, and BB-55. So at 1,700 hours, the bogeys are now bandits and are headed for the Enterprise. Combat Air Patrol attempts to intercept, but again, radio issues force them to scatter. The Flight direction officers have too many contact reports, and the fighter pilots are chattering wildly over the radio, thus blocking FDI from issuing vector orders on where the bogeys are. Despite having an overwhelming cap, most of them do not engage. But what cap does engage absolutely wreck the Japanese. As the Val dive bombers from Shokaku arrive, over CV-6, they're engaged by the F-6 combat air patrol that chased them down through their dives. The F-6 pilot Don Runyon attacked and downed three valves and a zero, chased another two valves away 
and damaged another in mere minutes. Cap claims 44 kills against five losses. Actual numbers are 25 shot down, which is a 43% loss rate, Seth. But again, friendlies have to break off before the, those enemies, the bogeys, get within air defense range of the, the surface shooters, the, the ships that are going to be shooting up, mm -hmm. lest these surface guys shoot down some friendlies in blue-on-blue -blue engagement. So what happens then? Right. Well, Enterprise's Combat Air Patrol, and you made a perfect point there, Bill. You know, they send a lot of, and again, this goes back to the growing pains of American carrier operations in 1942. You know, they got all these friggin' wildcats aloft to go intercept these Japanese planes coming in, and the, the fighter director can't get orders out because these guys are yakking on the damn uh, radio and they, they can't hear the orders coming in. And then there's issues with the, the, the ionosphere and all this other stuff that causes issues with radio communications throughout the day. But you know, it's, it's just a mess. But when the fighters do get there, they actually do some good, but it's just, it's too little too late. Um, and it's, it's, it's inevitable in the early part of 1942, really until Santa Cruz that, that, when the Japanese do slip through the combat air patrol and they inevitably do, uh, they do some damage. And this is no different. Uh, the Japanese slip some fouls through the combat air patrol. They get through the fighter umbrella and they approach enterprise and her escorts. Um, as the Japanese line up over CV six and they do, they line up, you know, in echelon formation, bing, 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 bang, right over top of enterprise, uh, BB 55, of course, that's USS North Carolina cuts loose. This is the first time a fast battleship battleship, is escorting an aircraft carrier in combat and this thing lights the sky up with her triple a suite and just absolutely looks like she's on fire she shoots so much uh, up at the uh, japanese um the volume of fire put up by as they called her the showboat actually rattles the japanese as they're lining up on cv6 they shoot down a great number causing many to miss in their dives however uh, despite the combat air patrol and the screening in AAA, the VALs do break into their dives and they scream down on Enterprise in seven second intervals. Now, again, you got to remember these are these early war Japanese aviators, Bill. These are these, are these, these are the guys that attack Pearl Harbor. And these mm -hmm. are pros. These are the best aviators in the world. And they are screaming down on Enterprise in seven second intervals. And which one, the ones that are making it through their dives are they're good. These, these guys are good, but Captain Arthur Davis of the Enterprise is, is good too, isn't he? He is, yeah. The, 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 remember, it only takes one. This is why they saturate you with so many aircraft, because they realize most of them aren't going to get through, but it only mm -hmm. takes one. So Arthur Davis is maneuvering his ship brilliantly. Again, this isn't just a, a runway on a ship. It's, it's maneuverable. It's a maneuvering entity mm -hmm. in and of itself. And he causes many of the bombs to splash into the sea behind the great ship. At 1714, so this has been going on for, let's just say, an hour or so. <clears throat> At 1714, a 500-pound bomb crashes through Enterprise's flight deck near the after elevator. Famous photograph of this, right? Mm -hmm. It punches through five decks before exploding, killing 35 men immediately. 30 seconds later, another bomb hits Enterprise, only 15 feet from the first one, exploding in the starboard five-inch gun gallery, wiping out the crewmen stationed there, burning them to a cinder at their gun position, killing all 38 men in a blinding flash. So this is not recoverable at this point. Enterprise, like her sister Yorktown, she's a tough girl, allowing Captain mm -hmm. Davis to continue to maneuver her at high speed despite the two heavy hits that, that she had taken and throwing up an impressive double-A screen. Some 14,000 rounds of ammunition were fired by Enterprise alone. In two minutes after the first two bomb hits, a third big hit up forward does minimal damage. When I say not recoverable, I mean this becomes a mission kill. So mm -hmm. it's not that it's going to sink the ship. But it's taken the Enterprise out of action, Seth. It, it most certainly does take Enterprise out of action, at least for this period of time. And there's some things that happen to the Enterprise down below, you know, and, and 
I'll show the footage of these bombs hitting the flight deck and then the bomb exploding on the starboard inch, uh, starboard five inch gun gallery. And it's, it's shocking footage. And while that footage is very visceral and it's very obvious that this is a significant strike that's been laid on this American aircraft carrier, the actual real nasty damage is below decks. Below and, decks. and to Bill's point, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, this is where ships can sink. <laughs> You know, you always say you let you sink ships by letting water into the ship as opposed to burning the ship down, although the case of COG is a little bit different, obviously. But yeah. while the third bomb does little damage to the flight deck, uh, the previous two bombs that hit Enterprise certainly do damage. Uh, the DC parties below decks are fighting to keep the ship running. And while topside looked as if the hits were not that serious, as I said, they most certainly were. Uh, Bill, the first bomb destroy and this is this is a badass story that we did not talk about in our eastern solomons episode because we didn't have the time but we got the time here um the first bomb destroys the ventilation to the after steering room on enterprise uh sucking foam and water the men shut the vent station down sealing it off uh lacking outside ventilation the temperature in the compartment begins to soar and i mean soar uh, chief machinist william smith tried calling engineering on the sound phone, but was too weak to talk. The temperature continued to rise until it hits a searing 180 degrees inside mm -hmm. this compartment. Men in the steering room begin to drop like flies due to the extreme heat. Bill, this is a bad situation. So now, yes, Enterprise is a fire topside, but all of a sudden she loses steering control. And, and this is, this is, Bad news, Bill. What's going on up topside on the bridge? Yeah, for Aussie friends, that's 180 degrees Fahrenheit, and 212 is boiling point. And so, yeah, we're getting close to boiling point here. Now, normally, to, you know, it takes a ruptured steam main to cause temperature in a space to go up that high. Um, and that's not, you know, what happened here. Well, this is after steering. So this isn't, uh, you know, a steam main, a steam uh, engineering space per se. And on the bridge, Big E is plowing ahead at 20 knots and then takes a sudden uncalled for turn to starboard. The helmsman grabbed the wheel and received no answer in his turn because where was we talking about? We we're talking about after steering, right? The Big E was on a, was a runway, on, was a runaway, on fire, out of control. The steering room and its hell like heat was the culprit. So Below in the steering room, one man remained conscience, conscious, Mach machinist mate William Marco, realizing that no one else was conscious, he remembered saying to himself, the Big E depends on me. Somehow in the steering heat, he gathers enough strength to start the ventilation backup unit on. Despite this, steering remained out and heat continued to rise. Now, in the space above, men put on breathing apparatus and went down into the heat. Three times, men tried to get below to restore steering and pull men out. Finally, men were able to reach the compartment and pull men away from the hellfire. Greasing the rudder shafts, Chief William Smith restored steering as the heat slowly abated. The chief stayed in the compartment over 24 hours straight making sure everything was ship shape. The damage control officer, Commander Yost, ordered Smith out and finally gave up. Smith finally gave up, allowing the chief to, oh, no, no, I got this wrong. He, Yost orders Smith out. Smith won't listen to him. Yost finally gives up and allows the chief to stay at his station. Chief Smith receives a Navy cross and promotion to Lieutenant Junior grade for his actions, Seth. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when you're talking about an aircraft carrier, it's impossible to not talk about the air group because, I mean, that's what an aircraft carrier is there for is, is to get that air group into action. But in instances like this where, you know, a ship is hit and, and, and hit badly, you know, it's not the air group that's going to stop those fires. It's not the air group that's going to you know restore steering. It's not the air group that's going to keep that ship from sinking. It's the Blue Jackets, it's and, and it's and it, yeah, it's ship's company, and it, and it's and it's usually always 
those old grizzled chiefs. And I, Bill, I know you probably have 10,000 stories about old grizzled <laughs> chiefs that served <laughs> under you. And you know, the chiefs are like the sergeants in the army. Over in the me when I was enlisted, some of my best teachers, yeah. both when I was enlisted and an officer were chiefs. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and this, uh, you know, I, I'm not inaccurate when I say that the chiefs are like the sergeants in the Corps and the army, they run that ship. Yes. The officers are in charge, but those mm -hmm. chiefs run that ship. And, and this is no, yeah. And this is no different here. You know, it's the old grizzled chief that literally saves the enterprise. And she was a runaway to your point. Exactly. I mean, this thing, this is a, you know, 800 foot aircraft carrier with no friggin' steering plowing through the American task force. And this right. cat gets her back up and running. It's, and it's a very, very inspiring. One story. human being can make a difference. I mean, that's the lesson here. Mm -hmm. One human being yep. can make a difference. Yep. So, so Bill enterprise is hurt, but she's not dead. Uh, mm. She takes some significant damage here though, right? 240 tons of water in some lower compartments had four feet of standing water in them. Um, there was a two by four foot <laughs> hole in her hull just above the water line, and she's seeping fuel oil. But yeah, I mean, shore, shoring parties, you get down there, you, you put the shoring in, you try to you know, stop the ocean from coming in the ship, you start pumping the water out. Uh, so you fight the casualty. Again, as I've said dozens of times on this on our podcast, Seth, even when you're not in combat, the sea is trying to kill you. And this was one of those times. So she retires to Pearl Harbor for damage repair and buries her dead. Some 78 killed in action and a further 90 wounded, Seth, which takes us yeah. to our next battle. Yep, Santa Cruz. And, you know, the Enterprise gets to Pearl. We talked about this. I forget on which episode, Bill. I don't remember anymore. But she gets to Pearl. And you got to remember the situation here in the Pacific at this time. Now, from August through middle of October, Enterprise is in Pearl Har Harbor under repairs. And she is one of the, she's not the only, but she is one of the only American aircraft carriers in the Pacific fleet at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, at this time, but in, in between there, Wasp is sunk by a Japanese submarine. Um, Yorktown Saratoga takes it. another. Yeah. Yorktown's been sunk at Midway. Lexington's gone at Coral Sea. Saratoga takes another friggin' torpedo. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's Hornet and Enterprise and that's it. And Admiral Nimitz, there's a famous picture and I'll have to, I didn't show it in that episode, but I'm going to show it in this one. Uh, Admiral Nimitz has a sign painted and puts right at the gangway of Enterprises. She's at Pearl Harbor under repairs. And it says something along the lines of number one ship, top priority, get this ship back in the fight. And it's Nimitz who does that. And well, he doesn't paint the sign, obviously, but he orders that sign to be put out there because he's fully aware that Enterprise and all of her battle experience is desperately needed in this furball that's occurring consistently off the shores of Guadalcanal. And to that end, she does make it back to sea she leaves Pearl Harbor in the middle of October. She's out of action for almost two months. So, I mean, these wounds that are suffered at Eastern Solomons are nothing to sneeze at. And, mm. and, and she's out of the war for two months here. Um, now, she's still Pearl, yeah. Kudos to Pearl yeah. Harbor Naval Shipyard, though. I mean, they're, they're nicknamed Noka Oi, which means number one in Hawaiian. And boy, time after time after time during the war, they get it done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is certainly certainly one of those cases. And, you know, Enterprise definitely needed to go back to, you know, Bremerton or someplace like that. She needed to go back to the States and have full repairs, but there wasn't the time for that. And Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard is the one, are the ones that get this job done and, and they get her back to sea. Um, she gets back out to the waters of Guadalcanal in the middle of October. She still retains her well-trained deck crews, DC parties and the like. And for now, uh, She's obviously a very, very battle-tested aircraft carrier. For the first time in the war, she receives an all-new air group, Bill. She receives Air Group 10. And mm -hmm. these guys are, it, this, is a, this is the first squadron that comes out having learned from the veterans. Our first squadron, I'm sorry, first air group that comes out having learned from the veterans. And they're replete with new guys and veterans of, you know, within their own ranks. 
So these are some of these new guys that are coming out of the guys that were trained by Dusty Cleese and, and Wade McCluskey and people like that. Um, and they're led by veterans themselves. Uh, you know, it, they're led by guys and they, Jack Lepla, uh, Swede Vetiza, Jimmy Flatley, all these guys that are just these, you know, Flash highly Gordon. experienced combat veterans. Flash, yeah, Flash Gordon. Flash Gordon's yeah. one of these guys. He's a new guy. So Flash is a mm -hmm. new guy. Uh, he, he's a guy. Donald Gordon is his name. Obviously, Flash. There's obvious reasons why they call him Flash Gordon. Um, he uh, He's one of these new guys, but he's taken under the wing, literally, of guys like Swede Vetiza and Jimmy Flatley. And so is Whitey Feitner. Whitey Feitner, Edward L. Feitner, who attains flag rank at a later date uh in his career he he's also one of these new guys that is seen to have a lot of talent and he's taken under the wing of jimmy flatley and sweet Betta and jack leppel and people like that who have an intense amount of combat experience and they help develop these guys into some of the finest naval aviators that ever fly mm -hmm. flash gordon is an ace whitey feitner is an ace sweet Betta's is a legend i mean it goes on and on and on and on and on again the the leadership factory of enterprise it, it just continues yeah. all the way through the war Let, i do want to make this point though that we kind of in, in, intimated this early in the war the the air wing was attached to the carrier um it was right you know air wings you know six for for cv6 and all of that as carriers got damaged destroyed and we we're having to move squadrons from one carrier to another, and suddenly, you know, Fighter 6 is on another aircraft carrier, not CV-6. Bad example, but because it normally happened the other way around. Um, you know, but the point is, it no longer, in fact, we've moved squadrons from carriers to shore in Guadalcanal. It no longer made sense for this, and particularly when the carriers were going to be in maintenance for a couple of months, to have an air mm -hmm. wing sitting around. I mean, obviously that made zero sense at all. So the air wings were being crafted independent of the carrier and then assigned to whatever carrier was ready to, to go to sea. And, and so this, that's a structure that exists even today. So mm -hmm. an air wing would embark on the carrier that was going to deploy. And it's not necessarily the same air wing every time. Right. Yeah. And, and exactly to your point, Enterprise gets back into Pearl for those repairs after Eastern Solomons and her air group, you know, that we said is kind of a composite group. You know, it's got VS5, VT3, VF6, VB6. They they scatter to the four winds. You know, those guys go all over the place and she needs an air group and air group 10, which is fighting 10, torpedo 10, scouting 10 and bombing 10. They're all sitting on Maui. And when Enterprise is ready to go, she needs she needs an air group. So, you know, Air Group 10 is, is that first iteration of what you were saying, Bill, is that these are the first guys that, that it's an all new Air Group that goes aboard a carrier in need. And, uh, you know, Air Group, turn, Air, Air Group 10 turns out to be probably the finest Air Group of 1942. And that's saying a lot, you know, when you look at Yorktown's Air Group at Coral Sea and Enterprise Air Group in 1940, early 1942. But, you know, these are the same guys that you'll see again in 1944, a lot of them anyway. When, it, when uh, 10 makes its second tour on Enterprise, and that'll be an episode two on the Enterprise. But, you know, we're talking about Battle of Santa Cruz here now, Bill. And there's a guy, and again, Leadership Factory, a guy named John Cromlin, who was called Uncle John to both brown shoe and black shoe alike. Uh, he was a beloved figure on Enterprise, and, and a lot of people called him Mr. Enterprise uh, it, from his entire time aboard Enterprise, which was a long period of time. Um, before the Battle of Santa Cruz, or actually literally the night before the Battle of Santa Cruz, he decides to give a pep talk to his aviators, and I'm going to read it exactly as he said it, so forgive the language, but it's exactly verbatim to what the man said, and he says, quote, this may be the beginning of a great battle. Four Catalinas have been tracking the Japs and their carriers. You men will have the privilege tomorrow of proving the worth of your training, your schooling, our way of life against the Japs. The Japs are determined to drive us out of the South Pacific. If they get through to Guadalcanal tomorrow with their carriers, they will take it. If Guadalcanal falls, our lifeline to Australia will be menaced. To stop them, you must knock out their carriers. If you're going to miss with your bomb, you might as well stay home and let a good pilot take your place. We're on the right side of this war. God is with us. 
Let's knock those Jap bastards off the face of the earth. God bless you. If that doesn't fire up a naval aviator to do their job, I don't know what will. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's a hell of a speech. And the next day, October 26th, is an important day in Enterprise's history, Bill. It's a day full of action for Enterprise. Let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. what, what goes on yeah. here? Starts with Bucky, Bucky Lee, the skipper of VS-10, spotting Nagumo's carrier at 0650. Climbs to attack altitude, but he's driven off by combat air patrol. Lee's scouting report alerts every SPD in the area and drives them towards the Japanese like flies the honey. Radioman Clarence Garlow hears Lee's report, jots it down and reports the contact to his pilot, Bernie Strong. Remember him? Mm -hmm. So let's talk, you know, tell us a few things about Bernie and the Eastern Solomons. Remember that, Seth? Yeah, so Bernie Strong got a lot of criticism from Uncle John, from Cromlin, uh, because at Eastern Solomons, he spots the Japanese carriers. He's one of the first guys to spot the Japanese carriers. And he mm -hmm. reports the position of the Japanese carriers, yet he elects, for some strange reason, to not attack and brings his bomb back to Enterprise. And he is criticized heavily for this. Now, this guy is a very headstrong individual. He is a typical naval aviator. He thinks, you know, that he walks on water. And... Cromlin, Uncle John says, well, if you're so good, then why in the hell didn't you do what you were supposed to do? He tells him this the day after Eastern Solomons. And that speech that I just read to you guys, uh, where he talks about if you're, you know, not going to attack and not make a hit with your bomb, then let some good pilot take his place. That was directly at Bernie was Strong. It? And there is no. no, yes, yes, absolutely. Because mm -hmm. Cromlin knew that Strong was a good pilot. And nobody knows why he didn't attack at Eastern Solomons, but the fact remains that he did not. Mm -hmm. However, he is determined to not let Uncle John down, and he is determined to make his mark here, and that is exactly what he does. <coughs> he you know, was a, a fantastic... Go ahead. You know, it's a put-your-money-where-your-mouth-is moment, right? Yeah, so he diligently plots the contact report. He adjusts his fuel mixture for maximum distance, and heads in the direction of the sighting. Showing off his supreme navigation skills, he finds the enemy 20, 20 minutes later as two of the three carriers in the area emerge from cloud cover. At the same time that strong as women, wingman Irvine approach two other SPDs, one piloted by Red Carmody, were being harassed by Cap Zeros, leaving Strong and Irvine wide open for a clear attack. Diving from 14,000 feet at 0740, Strong pops in and out of the clouds for 30 seconds. At 1,500 feet, the clouds part, and directly beneath him was the flight deck of Zhuiho. Both Strong and Irvine planted their 500-pounders into the flight deck of Zhuiho. The hits were not fatal, but did force her to withdraw, Seth. Yeah, so he definitely, <laughs> he takes Uncle John's criticism to heart, and Bernie delivers a hit here. And and he, again, to your point, it's not fatal. Zuiho does not sink. But to what you said about Enterprise at Eastern Solomons, this is a mission kill. Zuiho is no longer a factor for the remainder of this event. Now, her planes are already aloft. Bernie Strong doesn't know that. But mm. for the remainder of the event, Zuiho is a non-factor. Much like at Eastern Solomon's Enterprise comes an attack here at Santa Cruz as well. Uh, Japanese vows spot her at 1000 hours. Uh, they commence their attack at about 1015, led by a gentleman named Seki, uh, Lieutenant Keiichi Arima, or Arima Keiichi, depending on how you want to pronounce it, who had actually hit the Enterprise at Eastern Solomon's, again dies on Enterprise and scores yet another hit on the ship. Dead center near the bow, the bomb flew through the flight deck and exploded in the water, showering CV-6 with shrapnel and starting fires in the forecastle. Uh, seconds later, another bomb hit CV-6 near the after portion of the forward elevator, exploding in the hangar deck, killing 40 men. Uh, a, a AAA shell cooks off in a nearby compartment and kills another four men. The uh, AAA shell knocks out one William Pinckney, unconscious, but he regains his senses. 
Bill, William Pinckney is a guy we talked about in our Santa Cruz episode, and he's worthy of repeat here. Mm -hmm. um, he's an African-American, little bitty dude. He's like five foot two, like 120 pounds, a little bitty old guy. Mm -hmm. And when this bomb goes off and the AAA shell cooks off, you know, guys are getting hit by shrapnel. He is not hit. It just knocks him out. When he comes to, he sees bleeding guys, dying guys all around him. And this little bitty old cat starts grabbing these big old boys and hauling them up the ladder to breathable air. And as mm -hmm. I said, this guy, a little bitty dude, he's like, like five, two, five, three, 115, 120 pounds soaking wet. And he's pulling guys out of the, out of the enterprise by sheer adrenaline that probably weigh, you know, 180, 200 pounds. And he does this three or four times before he himself passes out due to smoke inhalation. He does live. And he's both wounded uh, and, and he, he has third degree, he has third degree burns while he's doing this. It's incredible. Yeah. So everybody will remember that Doris Miller was the first African-American awarded the Navy Cross for, mm -hmm. you know, his uh, performance at Pearl Harbor during the attack. And um, William Pinckney, I think, is the second here at uh, Santa Cruz. I, 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 may, I may be wrong on, on there may be others between Doris Miller, Miller and Pinckney, but, but I'm not aware of so. them. They are. Yeah. So no, I don't think so. I, I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, when I joined the Navy, I weighed 135. And my goodness, I don't know. I don't think I could have done this. So <laughs> it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was a true hero. And he's one of these guys that unfortunately, and there was a ship named that. I think there was a USS Pinckney that was named after, it was, him, yeah, after he absolutely. passed away. Mm -hmm. But um, he's one of these guys that's unfortunately lost to history. And when you're talking about a ship like Enterprise, and you're talking about guys like Wade McCluskey and Dick Best and all the, you know, and Jig Ramage and all these people, Swede Vettas that are just these legends. It's easy for guys like Pinckney to slip under the rug, but it's also important. And this is part of the reason why we do this show is to make sure that people do remember a lot of these guys that are lost to history. And Pinckney's one of them. And he was an absolute genuine, 100% grade A hero. And I think, Absolutely. Bill, you are right. I think he was the second Navy Cross recipient who was an African-American. I do believe he was mm -hmm. number two. Um, uh, and there were several others that occurred, you know, that, that were awarded the Navy Cross uh, for, for actions on USS San Francisco in, in the following months, but I think he was number two. Um, Enterprise takes a third bomb that was a rattling near a tooth rattling near miss. It opens up hull plates and uh, empties two fuel bunkers and flings an SBD overboard while another bounces into the catwalk. There's footage of this. I'll show that too. Uh, mm -hmm. And by 1020, the attack is over. Um, but that's just the Val attack. At 1035, Bill, the Cates arrive and mm -hmm. one of the cat pilots that engages is an Enterprise fighter pilot named Swede Vetiza. Tell us what happens here. During the attack on Hornet, Swede engages and shoots down one of the valves that was about to dive on CV-8, as well as one of the valves that attacked CV-6. Still aloft and with the majority of his ammunition still available, Swede switches off his two outboard weapons so as to conserve ammo, climbs above the Kate, el above the Kate's altitude, dives into them, and begins picking them off one by one, dropping five of the bandits in about 15 seconds. And I believe, isn't he flying a, um, he's not flying a Hellcat, right? Um, mm -mm. No, he's flying a Wildcat. Wildcat, yeah. So remember, one of the strategies we talked about in my episode, second Pearl Harbor episode, is dive down on whatever airplanes, it's meant for zeros, but I think this became the tactic of choice. And then, you know, if you can, shoot them. If you can't, peel off when you're really low because they had a hard time turning to starboard. And so and, and mm -hmm. their attempt to turn to starboard, sometimes it would fly into the drink. I, I don't know if he's trying to do that, but it sure sounds that way uh, based on this attack approach he's, he's using right now. So he drops one of the five bandits in about 15 seconds. His last target, another Kate, was riddled by Swede's guns, but, he, but it flew on. The aircraft piloted by T Takai Kiyomi drops down, flies over South Dakota, and deliberately crashes onto USS Smith. The dead aircraft slid off the ship, but the torpedo cooked off, setting the destroyer ablaze. Smith, under the command of Lieutenant Commander Hunter Wood, steers directly into the boiling wake of Sodak, 
the enormous wake thrown up by the battleship sliding along at 27 knots extinguishes the flames. We talked about this too. Allowing the plunk, plucky little destroyer to re resume station and resume firing. And, you know, you can pronounce his name better than I can, <laughs> but he's credited with downing seven Japanese aircraft in that one combat air patrol mission. He would be recommended for the Medal of Honor, but instead would receive his third Navy Cross. Vedasa? Yeah. Is that how you pronounce it? Vedasa, yeah. Swede Vedasa. Stan Stanley J. Swede Vedasa. Yeah, he was yeah. an incredible, incredible human being, uh, one of my very good friends. He was, by all accounts, anybody who flew with him at any point in his career, which was a very long career, he retired as a captain as well, um, he was generally said to be the finest naval aviator afloat anytime he grabbed a stick. You know, and, and, and again, this is in the company of people like Alex Rashu and David McCampbell. I mean, and, and they almost universal and, and the fighter pilot world at that time was a very small world. So they all knew one another and they all almost universally said that Swede was the finest naval aviator afloat. And he proves it here. He drops down, he drops seven Japanese aircraft in this one wow. mission, which at that time was the highest uh, score in one mission. It, it, it was since of course broken after that, but, but for a while it stood as the highest uh, single mission kill record of the war. Um, and you're right, Bill, he was a, a recommended for the Medal of Honor, but uh, Swede, Swede was a talker. He had kind of a mouth on him. And uh, I think, and he thought that friends above, and my friends, I use air quotes, friends mm -hmm. above him, quashed that Medal of Honor uh, recommendation and gave him a Navy Cross because he did actually shot down more Japanese aircraft saving Enterprise than Butch O'Hare did saving Lexington. And of course, mm -hmm. Butch gets the, the blue ribbon. Honor, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Enterprise dodges a total of nine Japanese torpedoes. By now, she's under the command of a gentleman named Captain Osborne Hardison. Uh, when when these Kates are coming in, despite the fact that Sweet's shooting seven of them down, uh, Hardison goes from port to starboard on the wings of the bridge, looking at the torpedoes, giving direct orders to the helmsman to comb the wakes. In other words, drive into the torpedoes here, Bill. Not a mm -hmm. single torpedo hits Enterprise. She dodges all nine. And that's that's a lot of fish to dodge with an aircraft yeah. carrier. Sooner or later, the odds are going to catch up with you. And so it's amazing yeah. that he's able to do this. Yeah. And, you know, Swede Vettiza certainly gets a lion's share of the credit for keeping Enterprise afloat at Santa Cruz because she she was attacked, you know, viciously by the Japanese. Uh, but another ship that that another entity that gets a lot of credit for keeping her afloat, of course, is USS South Dakota. And we bemoan, you know, Captain Gatch and, and the ineffectiveness of South Dakota during the battleship fight. But however, in 1942, this is her finest moment for sure. Uh, she keeps station a scant 1,000 yards astern of Enterprise, matching every move that the aircraft carrier makes to so as to provide AAA with her new 40 millimeter Beaufort guns. Uh, she claims 26 kills, which is a highly unlikely mark. Uh, post-war analysis actually give her credit for 20, which is still impressive mm -hmm. as hell. Uh, yeah. And it's no doubt that her guns and Swede keep Big E afloat here. That's great. Those are the quad bofers? Are these where they yeah. first show up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yep. For sure. They, they were a game-changing weapon for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill, there's, a, there's another guy we got to talk about before we wrap this sucker up. Uh, and he, again, is a legend. And I feel like a broken friggin' record, but it's a legend sailing aboard USS Enterprise and it's qualified aviator, but landing signal officer, Robin right. Lindsay. And Robin Lindsay performs what is called, what was called then and still called now the virtuoso aboard Enterprise at Santa Cruz here. And it's unbelievable, but it's 100% true, Bill. Yeah, it's like conducting an orchestra, being landing signal officer. You're you're trying to help the pilot who can't necessarily see as much as you can see as the, as the land pilot whose landing is coming in. You're trying to help him connect his, not just his, his glide slope. So is he on glide slope? Is he above glide slope? Which means he's gonna strike the one wire or no wire at all. Is he below glide slope? Which means he's gonna struck, he might get a ramp strike. 
and hit the you know edge of the ship instead of the, the flight the, the the deck the landing deck and so the LSO is critical to a pilot's ability to put that airplane safely aboard ship and then like a conductor who's conducting the orchestra a good LSO is a virtuoso so that he receives word from the bridge to stop landing aircraft as the deck is clogged knowing that the majority of the remaining aircraft are SBDs, he elects literally to pull the plug from his headset, ignore orders, and bring the boys down. <laughs> so, yeah, I, can't, I can't disobey orders I didn't hear, so I'm going to unplug my right. headset. <laughs> right. So Lindsay lands so many planes that he was landing the last batch on the last arresting wire. They had to la- hit that last arresting wire, otherwise they were going to run into the aircraft on the deck in front of them. Mm-hmm. You normally, you, you, you aim for the three-wire and hope you hit it. Knowing, aiming for the five-wire, if you're short, it's going to be a ramp strike. If you're long, you're crashing into the planes that have already landed. That's incredible. So last the land was Swede, catching the number one wire with 50. Actually, it was number, the last wire, right? with 56 yeah. other aircraft jammed ahead of him on the deck. The confidence that Swede has in Lindsay is insane here. Also, the yeah. confidence that Lindsay has in Swede is also nuts. With Hornet dead, CV-6 was all that was left. So if Swede crashes on the flight deck, he potentially wipes out all that remains of American carrier aviation and all the other airplanes that haven't landed yet are going into the drink. So Swede jumps yep. out, shakes Lindsay's hand vigorously as the crowd gathers around. He and Lindsay all cheering. This is a legendary moment, Seth. Absolutely. Absolutely legendary. And the, 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 what you just said, again, think about this, guys. If Vetiza ramp strikes or if he jumps and lands into those 56 aircraft parked on Enterprise, you're going to have one hell of a fire. And Enterprise yes. is, you know, she's already badly wounded. And but now if that happens, she's out and she may go down. You know, you never know. But the fact remains is that all those aircraft are gone, or at least the majority of them are gone. And with Hornet dead, there aren't very many U.S. Navy aircraft left to fight this battle off the shores of Guadalcanal. So, I mean, that just makes it all the more impressive, you know, when you think of that story. It's it's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. It really is. But again, it's true. One hundred percent true. So Santa Cruz ends with Enterprise beaten and battered, but she's not dead. Forty four ships company have been killed at Santa Cruz, as well as 16 missing air crew. Um, the evening CCV six crew wander aft to see the dead. Uh, pale corpses, some with catastrophic wounds, lay under blood stained white sheets. Others were being slid into mattress covers with five inch shells for weight. Their burial at sea would come soon. Uh, Jimmy Flatley. His Reapers, VF-10, the Grim Reapers, having lost six men, writes to the mothers and wives of his fallen pilots, quote, God in his divine wisdom calls us when he wants us. I, am, I confidently hope that when our call comes, we will find your son waiting for us in heaven. When we do meet him again, he will be the same smiling, gentle, but strong man that remains now in our memory. The same could be said for all of Enterprise's dead at Santa Cruz. Bill, Captain Hardison heaps praise on his men, and rightfully so. Uh, Hardison recommends Bernie Strong for the Medal of Honor for his single-man attack on Zui Ho. As we said, Swede is also recommended. Neither of them get it. Um, They both get Navy crosses, which for Swede, as we said, is his third. Uh, On October 30th, despite the wounds, Enterprise is still needed. On October 30th, she arrives in Nomea, drops anchor next to the repair ship Vestal, and licks her wounds, there would be no going back to Pearl Harbor now. Mm -hmm. The Enterprise is it. There are no more American aircraft carriers in the Pacific Ocean. She is the last of the Mohicans. Uh, She is needed, and she is needed now, Bill. Vestal's repair Mm -hmm. crew is given an ultimatum by Admiral William Halsey, aren't they? Yeah, they are. And and as I recall, Seth, this is the same Vestal that was in Pearl Harbor during the December 7th attack, right? So yep. her depth repair crews say Enterprise will be out of action for three weeks. Halsey says, not a chance. You have 11 days. The fix-up job was ugly, 
but it worked. Doesn't need to be pretty, just needs to work. All three elevators functioned, and the battle scarred veteran could make 30 knots easily. On November 11th, to true to Halsey's guidance, Enterprise left Numea and company with Washington and Sodak, and again took station off the shores of Guadalcanal. Three days later, Air Group 10 pilots from Enterprise rendered the coup de grace to battleship Hie as Scoofer Coffin's VT-10 Avengers optimistically claimed three hits. Over the next several yeah. days, Enterprise <laughs> over the next several days, Enterprise hit many Japanese ships, including including cruiser Kunugasa, Seth. Yeah, yeah, you know, she's again, we said it at the beginning of this segment about Guadalcanal, she's there all the time and she tips the scales. Uh, on November 15th, Enterprise aviators wreak havoc on defenseless Japanese troop transports that have been left without protection, thanks to Willis Lee and Washington pounding Karishima the night before. On November 16th, Enterprise returns to Noumea to finish up repairs for Santa Cruz. Uh, her air group gets a breather. Enterprise again leaves Noumea in early December, rendezvousing again now with Saratoga, who's back from the yard for the first time since August. Big E was now no longer alone in the Pacific. Saratoga comes out and gives Enterprise a, a, a spell, if you will. Uh, and by the end of the year now, Guadalcanal firmly in American hands. Enterprise had been there at every single step of the way. She had taken a beating in Eastern Solomons in Santa Cruz, but had delivered beatings that had far exceeded those she had received. Enterprise's contribution was indisputable. She had quite literally been the saving grace for much of the campaign. Bill, while the beginning of the war saw Enterprise learn how to fight, by the end of the 1942, she knew how to fight, and she did it exceptionally well. Yeah, she did. In 1943, we'd see her head to Pearl Harbor for permanent repairs, because a lot of these repairs that she'd received were temporary patches. And so from May through July, and then it, that's when she was in Pearl Harbor for permanent repairs. And then in July, the Big E would sail for Uncle Sugar, <laughs> bound for Bremerton and a desperately needed refit. Now remember, repair gets you seaworthy, fixes things, refit upgrades your weapon systems. And she could only do that in Bremerton. She hadn't had a refit since before Pearl Harbor. That's incredible, Seth. Yeah, it, it really is when you think about it. You know, there's there are ships that are famous that, that receive repairs and refits and overhauls, even you know, full scale overhauls right. throughout this period. But she was so valuable to everything that's going on in 1942 that she quite literally could not be spared, even though she was in desperate need of an mm. overhaul, refit, what have you she could not be spared. And, and again, fanboy of enterprise fully admitting this right here, right now, there's a reason for that. You know, she, she could not be spared because she was providing consistent, constant uh, support for everything that was being done from December 7th until the end of 1942 bill. She, she gets a well-deserved rest from July through October. Uh, when she would once again sail for the Pacific Ocean, she would arrive in Pearl Harbor and wouldn't recognize the place when she gets back. This is not the same Pearl Harbor she left in 1942. Uh, it's flooded with ships and aircraft carriers. Enterprise would never again be alone like she was off the shores of Guadalcanal. She was now part of the almighty Task Force 58 the fast carrier forces, and together with her cousins, the Essex-class carriers and the Independence light, light carriers and all the other ones that would follow, would deliver the death blows to the Empire in 44 and 45. And Bill, unfortunately, this is where we're going to have to stop this episode because we have mm -hmm. run on long, and we've only talked about two years of the war for the Enterprise. Two years in the war, and it's taken us two hours to do it. And we're only hitting the highlights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I know we're going to get the, the inevitable questions. What books do we read? You know, Enterprise is mentioned in a gazillion books about the Pacific yeah, War, but there are two that's, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. There, there are two that stand out above the rest. Uh, the, of course, 
the big E by Edwin Stafford is, is the, the Bible on the enterprise. And, and there are copies of it still available. I don't know if it's been reprinted recently. I have no idea, but you can find copies of it anywhere. If it's not on Amazon, look on eBay, you can find it. Um, and then, of course, there's Enterprise, the fight in a ship in the United States Navy, written by my good friend Barrett Tillman, which is a newer version of the Big E with a lot of first person accounts by people that he interviewed along with me at, at a certain time. So uh, those two books are by far the standard when it comes to reading about USS Enterprise. Highly recommend both of them. Uh, they're both damn good reads. Damn good reads. Well, Bill, we got to wrap this sucker up and we're only halfway through the war here. Um, is there anything else you want to say before we punch out? Yeah, um, I'm glad we're we're able to talk about another ship that's not a submarine or the Indianapolis, <laughs> and the Enterprise. Yeah. You know, deserves all of the credit it can get. Yeah, absolutely. And we will pick up this story again in a couple of weeks. We've got some other recordings we want to do here, some other episodes we want to cover and some other topics we want to cover. But stay tuned. We will pick up the story of Enterprise this season, if not next week. And it won't be. It'll be in a few weeks, but it is coming part mm -hmm. two. Uh, so with that, we want to thank you very much for listening in on our conversation. Please subscribe to the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. Wherever you, wherever you receive your podcast, give us a rating and review. We do appreciate it. Also, if you want to see the video version of this and any of our other episodes, subscribe to our YouTube channel called the Unauthorized History of the Pacific War podcast. If you have a question, send us an email at unauthorizedpacificpodcast at gmail.com. Once again, my name is Seth Perrin, and I want to say thank you very much. And Bill. And I'm Bill Toady. See you again next week.